Alright, 1.1. Functions and function notation. Now that we've looked at domain and range, we have to understand how that applies to functions and using function notation. This is what we need to be more comfortable with. So, mapping notation. So, we're looking here at mapping notation and what that is. That is, we have two ovals. And in the first oval, that is the oval on your left, we'll have your domain, negative three, let's say this would be an example of your domain. What is important to note is that these numbers are always listed in order, and you'll never see them repeat each other. And in the range would be in the oval to the right, and you would have numbers there, again, in order and non-repeating. So. What would happen is that the domain would actually map on to the range so that you have values like this. Now, when you look at it, look at something like this, you have the domain that will go to one of these y values. Now, the question here would be, is this a function or not? Well, when we remember the definition, the definition of a function says for every x, there can only be one y. Do all of these x's only have one y? Well, in fact, folks, that is true. Therefore, this represents a function. So this one represents a function because every one of these x's has one y. Now, looking at another mapping notation, here's another example. And these you'll see is that all of these will map on to the y values. But what's more important is you will notice that this one in particular, the negative 1, maps on to two values. Because of that, that means that this one will not be a function. So repeat again. The first one is a function because for every x, there is only one y. The second one is only a relation because the negative 1 maps on to two y values, and because of that, it is not a function. It is only a relation. Now, when you state the domain of something in mapping notation, you state it in individual increments. So you don't write x belongs to real, like the once upon a time part, but what you do talk about here is you write out each individual x value as your domain. For the range, you write out each individual y value, again, in order, and non-repeating. So you, even though negative 2 is repeated three times, we only write it once when we list the range. And in the second one, you state the domain and you state the range. Now note again, you do not repeat numbers and you definitely write them in order. Okay, moving on. Function notation f with a bracket x represents a function. So this is actually pronounced f at x. So it's a function f with x as the variable. We pronounce this as f at x. So f is a function with x as the variable. So instead of using a second variable such as y, we use f to represent a function. Now we could use g, h, any other actual letter in the front. We kind of usually stick to f, g, h. Um, we don't try and use i. Uh, j has been used occasionally, but f at x is the first one that people tend to use. And f is to represent a function and in brackets the variable used within the equation. What happens is in later years, you will have multiple variables in an equation and you would have to use function notation with multivariable functions. Moving on. Example f at x equals x squared plus 3x plus 2, so a quadratic we represent in function notation. Now, remember, f at x is really essentially y, but the beauty of this is we could have multiple equations with different names, f, g, and h, and they would be related to each other, and instead of y equals each time. Okay, now, moving on. Example 1. Given f at x equals a particular equation, 
and g at x is equal to a second equation, you're asked to determine the following information. So we have f for one equation, g for the other. And x here, this f at x does not get separated. It is one single unit together, and g at x is one single unit together. They do not get separated whatsoever, even when you replace it with a number. So, f at negative 1, find g at 2, f at negative 2 minus g at 1, g at x equals 0. So these are the values you're trying to find. Well, the first one, think about what this is saying. f at negative 1, we have f at x up here. Hmm, that's right. x gets replaced with the negative 1. So every time you see an x, you replace that with negative 1. So you substitute. So this is, in a way, mathematical speak, saying substitute negative 1 for x every time you see the variable. So 3, we show this step by showing 3, and put in brackets negative 1 squared, plus 2 in brackets negative 1 minus 1. We plug that all in and we get the value of 0. So f at negative 1 equals 0. Moving on. g at 2. Well, our g equation is over here. We plug in 2 for x. We plug it into here and find that value. So that's 4 times 2 all squared minus 1. That is the answer 15. So 2 squared is 4 times 4 is 16. 16 minus 1 is 15. So you show the substitution step and you can go ahead and give me the answer. Now, f at negative 2 minus g at 1. What is that saying? Hmm, that's right folks. The negative 2 gets replaced in the f equation and the 1 gets replaced in the g equation and then we subtract that. Okay, one step at a time. So f at negative 2 is equal to this value. g at 1 is equal to this value. Now, did you have to write them separately? You could have, as shown here. And you write them together, f at negative 2 minus g at 1 is equal to 7 minus 3, which equals 4. So again, we found out f at negative 2, we plugged it in, found the value, g at 1, plugged it in, found the value, then we took the two values and subtracted them to get the answer. That is one way to do this problem. Is it the only way? Of course not. Another way is to actually do this in one step. That is, 3 times negative 2 squared plus 2 times negative 2 minus 1. So that's f at negative 2, and then minus g at 1. g at 1 means you take the g equation and plug in the 1. All together, we do the f at negative 2 step, that'll be 7. And then we do the g at 1 step, which is 3. 7 minus 3 means we will have the value 4. So again, we got the same values we did the last time, but the beauty of this way is that we don't have to do them separately. We can do them as one step. g at x equals 0. Well, hmm, what is that saying? Huh. Well, hopefully you're thinking, hmm, g at x equals 0. What if I put the g at, at that number where g at x is? That's right. Put the number 0 where the g at x is. So that means that 0 equals 4x squared minus 1. So again, 0 equals 4x squared minus 1. It used to be g at x, now it's 0 equals 4x squared minus 1. What do we do next? Well, what we're going to do next is factor 4x squared minus 1 into two parts. That is 2x plus 1 times 2x minus 1. We have to factor that. Some of you might be thinking, well, let's isolate for x squared. You could. But remember, there are two possible values for x. That is, one of the values for x is negative a half, and the other value for x is positive a half. So positive plus or minus a half. Now, one more time. Let's, another way we could do it 
is solve for x squared. So we move the 1 over, becomes 1 is equal to 4x squared. 1 quarter is equal to x squared. That means x is equal to plus or minus a half. So either way, whether we factored or we solve for the variable, we got x is equal to plus or minus a half. Okay, moving on. Example 2. Represent the following list of coordinates in a mapping diagram using mapping notation. To do that, we have to understand what this is saying. This, folks, is a list of coordinates. That is, each one of these, this is your domain that maps onto the range. 2 will map to 3, negative 1 will map to negative 2, and so on. So what we have to do is write two ovals, that's right, two ovals, folks, and put in the domain in the first oval in order. So we start over here. We have negative 5, that's the first one. Negative 3 is the second one. The next one is negative 1. Next one is 2. And then 7. Now, on to the range. We map, all right, let's go in order. We have negative 2. We have 3. And then we have 5. Even though some of these repeat, remember, we only write the number out once. So, now we map them all. Negative 5 will map to, so t we're going to do it in order. 2 will map to 3. That's the one we just did. Negative 1 will map to negative 2. 7 will map to 5. Negative 3 will map to negative 2. And negative 5 will map to 3. Now, so we just drew our mapping diagram. Here's a bonus question. Is this a function? Hmm. Think about it. Is this a function? Looking down for every x, is there only one y? That's right, folks. This is a function. Very good. All right, folks, that's the end of the video. Have a numerical day.